So I get a lot of questions from women saying, okay, I'm thinking about getting divorced or I just filed or he just filed. What am I going to get? What am I entitled to? And it's a very difficult question for me to answer. Well, obviously, because I'm not a divorce professional, but even for a divorce professional, this is a very difficult question to answer because there are so many circumstances when it comes to what a wife or a woman is entitled to in the divorce. But we're going to try to answer that question and talk about the many, many factors that go into answering this question. And I have a great guest for this. I'm so excited to see her face. Hi, Anna. Her name is Hi. Anna Krolikowska. Anna has been a divorce attorney for a couple decades, I think. <laughs> yes. I've known her for 10, oh. over 10 years. She works in Chicago and on the North Shore. Anna is also the former past, no, I'm sorry, cut that out. Anna is the past president of the Illinois State Bar Association, which Anna, I still find that so commendable. Great, great job yeah. getting that. So Thank you. welcome. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure spending time with you and your listeners. Same to you, Anna. So do you agree with me that don't you get a lot of people that come into your office for a consult? And the first question is, how much am I entitled to? What am I going to get? And it's it's important, but you really can't give them an answer until you find out all these other things. So it's it's a great question. And yes, it it gets asked in every single consultation. And and the initial answer is it depends, right? That's such a lawyer answer. It depends, but it really does. It depends on your particular situation. What is your financial picture? What does your life look like? Were you a stay-at-home wife and mother for a decade plus? Um, do you have medical conditions that prevent you from working? Um is there a significant marital estate? All of these factors, you know, these are a things family business. Yes. You know, yeah. okay. All so, of that. So what I want to tell my listeners, Anna and I are going to break this down. So if you're listening and you're wondering, what am I going to get? We just want to preface this by saying there's no guarantees, but we're going to talk about the laws and we're going to talk about the many factors that go into the decision, whether you get divorced via mediation, litigation, collaborative process. We're going to try to help you so that you're better prepared moving forward in your divorce. So I'm going to list all these factors, Anna, and then you can expand on them. Sure. Okay. First factor is... If you're a wife and a mother, or even just a wife, do you work? And if not, what's your earning ability? So tell me about that. So that's such a great question, right? So when I talk to a potential client, there are two starting questions that I ask. One looks at assets, because in a divorce, we're going to divide assets. And the other looks like that looks at the income side of things, right? And so the income side of the conversation asks about, are you working? And if you're working, is it a full-time position where you can support yourself? Or is it a part-time position where maybe you were taking care of kids, working a part-time job to kind of bring in some additional income? Or maybe you've been out of the workforce for whatever reason for a number of years and now you're in a position where the divorce is changing things and you are trying to re reevaluate what are my next steps, right? And if you've been out of the workforce for some time, it might not be possible for you to re-enter right away and get the same type of a job that you had previously or earn the same amount of money that you would have if you had stayed in your prior job. That doesn't mean that if you are going to litigate, a judge is going to just assume that you are incapable of making anything, right? If you are litigating, a judge is going to assume at some point that you're capable of earning something. And so the question becomes, what is it? What are you capable of earning? And that's going to be one of the um, issues in your case, in your litigated case. All right. Now, Anna, what does that look like in mediation? 
what kind of conversation do you have that where a judge isn't deciding, but the two of you with the mediator are going to decide? So either in mediation or in the collaborative process, you have more flexibility, right? You're able to have the conversation around why were you out of the workforce? Were you taking care of the family, supporting the family? How long will it take for you to re-enter the workforce in a way that will allow you to eventually support yourself or have the best likelihood of supporting yourself, right? Because generally people who choose mediation or collaborative do that because they want to be more gentler with each other, more amicable. Um, and so that might mean that maybe your support conversation means that it's not strictly a guideline support. Maybe it's a little bit above. Maybe it means you're getting more than 50% of the assets, right? Which is the starting point of this entire conversation. We started our conversation about what are you entitled for or entitled to? And is it 50-50? Not always. Okay. No. Now that is a good segue into the next factor of what it, what am I entitled to? which is assets. So I live in Illinois, so does Anna. And in Illinois, I always heard, and I went through a divorce, that it's you take all the marital assets, you split it up, 50-50 everything. But Anna, you're telling me that is not always the case. No. So the statute says, the statute, by the way, is Illinois Marriage and Dissolution of Marriage Act. So when divorce lawyers say the statute, that's the statute. And it governs the way we get married, the way we get divorced, the way we get annulments or legal separations, all of that. And so the statute says it's equitable. It does not directly say 50-50. Mm. It means that we need to be fair. So although in most people's minds, that means 50-50, that's not always the case. So again, I'm going to default to a judge for a moment, and then we can talk about mediation or collaborative process. But when a judge is listening to your lawyers arguing at a trial what he or she should do in terms of your property, they're going to be listening to a lot of factors or arguments why they should divide your property a certain way. And some of those factors are, how long have you been married? How old are you? Are you working? Are you capable of supporting yourself? What is your future earning potential? Um, what is your health like? And all of that relates to, should you receive more than 50% of the assets? Uh -huh. Wow. So it's all like interconnected. You it can't is. talk about one thing mm -hmm. at a time. You kind of have to talk about it all together. All right. And yeah. then again, in mediation, it looks a lot different. Well, yes and no. It's still all interconnected. It's just instead of the judge deciding, it's you and your spouse talking about these elements and reaching an agreement. So if you are preparing either for mediation or collaborative process or you're going to trial, try to think through your priorities, right? And when I work with my clients, I talk to them about the fact that you're not going to get everything. You're not going to get, you know, more than 50% of the assets and above the guideline uh, support and a whole laundry list of everything else that you want, because it is just not going to happen that either a judge is going to completely ignore everything else that your ex wants or in mediation or collaborative process that your ex is going to agree to everything you want and nothing that they want, right? So try to prioritize for yourself what is important to you and identify for yourself things that you're willing to let go, that you're willing to live with letting go of so that if you are in a situation where you're negotiating, you're not caught unaware. You've kind of thought about what is it that I can forego or let go so that you're prepared. Because when you let something go, your ex feels like that he won that yes. battle. And so it makes him give you something else. So very, very smart. That's the idea. 
That's the idea. You're listening to the Divorced Girl Smiling Podcast. My name is Jackie Pillisoff, and I'm your host. I'm here today with divorce attorney and mediator, Anna Krolikowska, based in Chicago and on the North Shore. And Anna and I are talking about how much is a wife entitled to in a divorce. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we have so many more factors to discuss about this. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Divorce Girl Smiling Podcast. My name is Jackie Pillisoff and I'm your host. Are you considering getting divorced and thinking, I wonder what I'm going to get? What am I entitled to? How am I going to end up in life? If so, this is a great episode for you. My guest is divorce attorney and immediate past president of the Illinois State Bar Association, Anna Krolikowska, based in Chicago and on the North Shore. Although, Anna, I think you take cases all over Chicago land, not just the North Shore. Okay. Chicago and the suburbs. Thank you, Jackie. Yes. Okay. So we're going to move on to some more factors. Tell me about kids. So does what you end up getting in a divorce depend on the ki- if you have kids, how old the kids are, and the parenting schedule that you end up with? Not directly. So if you have kids and there is a certain parenting schedule, the number of overnights impacts the child support, right? And there is also going to be a contribution to the kids' extracurricular activities, uncovered medical expenses, but it doesn't directly tie to the asset division, unless, see, with lawyers, there's always a, it depends or unless. However. Like, however, <laughs> exactly. Most lawyers are very like intellectual and, and we like thinking through things. That's, that's why we ended up going to law school. Like we like thinking about things. Anyway, if there's a situation where you're concerned about that assets maybe will get spent and you want to secure your kid's future expenses, whether that's the extracurriculars, the medical, the future college expenses, you can talk about, or if you're in a court proceeding, request that a judge do this, create a trust for the kid's benefit and fund it with assets. So that's a possibility. That's how assets could be used. There need to be enough assets available to do that. You are taking assets away from assets available for you and your ex to utilize. And it would be ha- would have to be something done by agreement or something that a judge orders you to do. But since we're talking about this, here's another tip from a divorce lawyer, right? Sometimes people do this. All right. But can I tell you something that's always yeah. really bugged me about the law? Sure. Okay. I feel like a lot of cases, because the amount of child support depends on the number of overnights, People who have to pay child support, and I mean men and women, they're both paying it. I mean, it's not always just men. They arrange the schedule because they don't want to pay. And so for me, that's such a bad system because it it incentivizes people to have more nights, even if they really know they can't handle it. Like, let's take a guy who travels all the time for his job. He's not going to be able to have 50-50 custody, but he's going to have to pay. And he might be really pissed and he doesn't want to pay. So he's saying, you know what? I'll take the 50-50. And then he gets his mother or a babysitter to come watch. And that's just so sad to me. And Anna, don't you kind of feel like that is another reason mediation or the collaborative process is such a better process? Well, I'm, I'm a big fan of collaborative process and mediation for a number of reasons. It allows you to structure your own agreements. It allows you to maintain um, amicable relationships rather than going through a court process and fighting and then coming out with a judgment and basically still you know, being in this fight mode. But you know, I've been doing this for almost 20 years. So at this point, I'm a pragmatist as well. And I realize not every case can be resolved via mediation or collaborative process, right? So for some people, litigation is all there is. But coming back to your original comment about how the child support is structured right now and and 
because of its focus on overnights that it tends to kind of push people into sometimes asking for more overnights because of their wish or focus to um, lower the child support amount. That's not how it used to be, right? 2015 is when child support st statute changed. And I'll, I'll give you some insight into why that happened. Part of the reason is because 40 other states by that point had changed how they calculated child support. And Illinois was getting a lot of pressure um, from federal funding sources to basically adjust and keep up with the rest of the country. And so that's part of the reason why the statute was changed before we looked at the income of only the person who was paying support. And that used to be the person who had less parenting time. It didn't matter whether they had overnights or how the ch the time was structured. It was just a percentage um, based on the number of children. Now it is tied to overnights and it, and we look at each parent's income. So yes, it has been a, a very big change and I'm glad you brought this up for two reasons. It gave us a chance to talk about it. And I think it's really important to point it out so that your listeners who might be going through a divorce now, who maybe are talking to their friends or family members who possibly went through a divorce more than 10 years ago and had different experiences understand that you know someone who has a child support order from 10 years ago who hasn't touched it has a very different child support amount than someone who has a more recent court experience. All right. Well, this is a good segue into we were going to talk about this at the end of the podcast, but I feel like we should talk about it right now. Yep. Why is it a really bad idea to compare your divorce to your girlfriends and other people? Now, you just said one because they might have gotten divorced over 10 years ago and the statute was different. It changed. But why else? Not only is the statute different, but your financial situation might be different. Your dynamic with your ex might be different. You know, whether the way you interact or your, you know, personalities or your medical conditions or your mental health conditions. Like there's just so many factors. Like everything could be completely different. Or maybe they went through collaborative process or mediation and you're litigating, or maybe they live in a different county. There could be so yeah. many reasons. Or a why. different state. Yes. Okay. And also, I remember when I was getting divorced, like people would go, oh, that's all you're getting. You must have a really bad lawyer. Like they just assume it's the lawyer, but you know, that is a factor, but that I don't think that's the reason I got what I got, but also it's the judge. It's the other person's lawyer. It, there's, there's too many factors to even talk about that go into every divorce case that makes each one unique. And I remember there was this woman at my gym getting divorced around the same time as me. And my friends kept saying, did you know she's getting like $10,000 a month oh in child support and alimony? And we were all like, oh my gosh. Well, I mean, okay, we found out later her husband made millions of dollars. Like, we, you know, it, it's just too, too many factors to sit and, the only way you should feel bad about your divorce is if you have a bad gut feeling about your lawyer and you think it might be time for a change. Other than that, you can't compare. What do you think, Anna? I agree with that 100%. Or you think there's something going on with your kids and you're concerned. Other than that, yes, take care of yourself. Try to stay in whatever process you chose, right? Mediation, collaborative litigation, do the best you can you can. If it's not working, you can switch whether the process or the attorneys or both or both. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and realize that this process, divorce process is hard. Even if you're in mediation, even if you're in collaborative process, although those two are generally gentler than litigation, it's still hard. Nobody goes through divorce and says, oh, that was easy. 
Exactly. And I wouldn't even talk about your friends' divorces with them. I would keep everything confidential because, you know, it's just, it's just going to upset you, frustrate you, make you feel disappointed that they seem like they're getting a better deal. It's just a bad idea. Yeah. And if you want support, find support in the right places, whether that's a coach, a therapist, a support group, divorce girl, smiling community, like find places where you can find that support in a non-judgmental, positive way. Right. And feel heard and validated. All right. We are not really running out of time, but we have a few more minutes and I want to make good on this promise of telling people about all these factors to consider okay. if you're sitting here thinking, what am I going to get? What am I entitled to? Let's move on to how long you you were married. So tell me about that factor. Does that play a role? It does. Look, if you were married for two years versus 20, that's going to, to be considered by a judge in terms of what you're going to get not just in terms of percentages, but dollar amounts as well contribution. What did you contribute to the marriage? And it's not just earnings per se. What did you contribute as as earnings that you brought in that bought the asset the assets? It's also did you by any chance contribute any non-marital assets that were then transferred or were used to acquire marital assets? Um Again, there's all of these factors, these reasons that a judge can consider as to why it might be more than than 50%. Okay, now what about if you, I always heard that if you live in Illinois, you don't get alimony unless you're married for 10 years. Is that true? It's not true. Okay, what, is there any law that states a, an amount so again, it's that statute, you know, when we did that rewrite, it was in, you know, starting in 2015, we did comprehensive rewrites of the statutes that dealt with marriage and divorce. And before that, you know, where it came to maintenance, we would kind of eyeball it or try to guess or, or give the best argument possible and see where we landed. Literally, sorry, I'm being a little bit, you know, facetious, but not by much. Um, and so the current statute actually has a guideline. It talks about both the length of time of the marriage. And based on that length of time, you can receive um, maintenance or alimony or spousal support for a certain period of time or a fraction of the amount of time you were married. And it talks about um, how much of maintenance you can receive. And how much is tied to how much your spouse is making versus how much you're making or could be making, depending on your situation. And again, we want to be realistic here, right? So let's say you haven't worked in 10 years and your spouse is going to say, oh, she can go back to her former job and make the same thing she was making then. And your lawyer, of course, is going to say, absolutely not. At best, she can maybe make minimum wage, right? Again, if you're litigating, that's the type of a conversation you're you're involved in. Or that could even happen in mediation. Absolutely. But mm-hmm. back to your original question. So if let's say you've been married for five years. Yes, you can still receive maintenance. It's just not going to be for a long period of time. Okay. So there's no set plan like mm-hmm. there is for child support. Like child support is a calculation. Maintenance is not. It's done on a case-by-case basis. So the the starting point for maintenance is, is this a maintenance case? Meaning, is this person who's potentially asking for maintenance a maintenance candidate? So are they not working? Do they need maintenance? If they need maintenance or are not working, if we run the guideline calculation, does it give us any maintenance? So I'm going to, I'm going to give you an example. And, and math is hard for some of us, especially if we're like trying to visualize it. Um, when I'm working with clients, I usually write it out because it helps, but let's say you have someone, we're going to try to make this easy, right? Let's say you have someone who's not working, making zero income and you have someone else who's making a hundred thousand dollars. Again, we're trying to make the math easy. So the guideline would be 
And by the way, 100,000 net after tax. Again, I'm trying to make the okay. math easy. So the guideline would say it's 33 and one third percent of the net income of the person paying. So $33,300 minus 25% of the net income of the recipient. And again, I'm giving the recipient zero income because I want to make this math easier, right? We're not going into whether the recipient should be making any money or whatever. We're just but if they were making 10,000 a year, that's 3,300 you take off. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's, okay. Let's do that. Okay. So we end up with 30,000. That would be the potential maintenance she is receiving. There's a secondary calculation and that secondary calculation is this. The recipient cannot have more than 40% of the combined total income. So we would take his 100 and her 10,000 and calculate 40% of that. So 40% of that is 44,000, right? Okay, I follow. So her 30,000 of potential maintenance plus her 10,000 of earnings is exactly $40,000, right? So she gets to keep the 30,000 of maintenance. So if it, it's over 40, you don't get to keep it. If it's over 40, the maintenance amount gets cut so that you don't get above the 40%. But that was wow. such a great question. Yeah. Okay. I love this. All right. And, and I really hope to our listeners that makes sense. If, if you does. need to write it, it out does. on a page so, and, and so it makes sense, are, do it. I think people are really benefiting from them because I know when I was getting divorced, I didn't know any of this. So this is really nice. If you're looking for a divorce attorney, obviously you should call Anna, but if you, uh, you know, live in another state or you're just looking around, you already are going in knowing so much information, which is great. And then you can ask follow-up questions on your consult. All right. Yeah. Last point, because now we're really running out of time. Anna, a lot of people say, well, how much am I entitled to my husband had an affair or he abused me mentally or physically? Does that have any bearing on what you get? Again, you ask such great questions. So let's tackle the physical or mental abuse first. Um, in Illinois, the court would not use that to in any way decide financial issues, right? They would not distribute money based on uh, finding fault in in regards to physical or or mental abuse, um, unless there was some, you know, physical damages, and maybe there was a personal injury lawsuit filed, right? But that's okay. kind of separate from the divorce piece, mm -hmm. and that doesn't usually happen. But I'm just putting it out there in case someone has a situation like that. The affair. Generally, again, judge would not apportion assets based on finding fault that someone had an affair or not. What they would do, though, is look or, you know, listen to you if you were to argue that your spouse spent marital money or marital assets on a third party, on their affair partner. And if they did. Trips, then, hotels, dinners. A trip to Mexico. Co a, a Clothing, expensive handbag, two thousand yeah. dollars or something yeah. like that. All of all of that stuff. And if you can prove it, then a judge would say they dissipated or wasted marital assets, and they would say they either have to pay that back to the marriage, so it's available for division, or you get a reimbursement or credit from the assets that are available for your portion of those funds that were wasted. I love that because that's so justice, <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. Anna, we're out of time. This has been so wonderful. Thank you so much. I really feel like you had a huge impact on helping people. I'm so glad. And I always enjoy our conversations. You Same. ask great questions. Same. You have great answers. So if you are listening to this and you like what you heard and you want to talk to Anna and set up a consult, you can find her at AnnaKLaw.com. And you can also find her on Divorced Girl Smiling 
in the trusted professional section. So if you want to find trusted vetted professionals like Anna and real estate agents, mortgage lenders, financial advisors, divorce coaches, and more, or you want to listen to more podcasts, read articles, download my mobile app, or sign up for my free consult, you can come see me at divorcedgirlsmiling.com. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. We'll talk to you real soon.